the, um, you know, we went through some very challenging times when we lived in Eugene and Springfield and in Oregon. And, and don't get me wrong, you know, we've had some great times there as well. Um, but there were some things there that we couldn't manage it in a way where our kids who really are, are probably more more defenseless at some at, at this stuff than than uh, than we are because we're you know we're we're grown we're educated around you know these topics and we also know how to navigate it in a way that a grown up or a professional would be able to navigate it unlike a fifth grader at the time our youngest was a fifth grader you know 16 year old and a you know a 14 year old you know so um when we were going through the situations that we were going through dealing with racism dealing with discrimination dealing with equity issues uh diversity challenges like all the, everything in the bucket that the, the, this, our country's going through we were already dealing with it but we're dealing with it uh we're dealing with it at a, I would say when you're, when we compare it to the deaths of like George Floyd and, and these other uh, high profile uh, figures right now in this, in this, in this current civil rights movement that our country's going through, right? We were already dealing with that at a, at a lower level. And so what grieves, what grieves us is the fact that why, why do we have to get to a George Floyd? Wasn't, wasn't our fifth grader getting the police called on him by the principal of a school enough, right? Wasn't him being labeled as a gang member and, and, and profiled as a gang member for only putting up a sign that he's seen an athlete throw up and he was just mimicking his, his, his favorite athlete. Why was he, why was that not enough, right? And he was suspended for it, right? Our youngest was suspended as a fifth grader for throwing up a gesture he's seen in a class picture, but yet in that picture, as I investigated it, there were two other kids that were his friends, two kids of color, that were all three of them got suspended. Now in the same class picture, there were two other white kids that were, th that were throwing up hand gesture signs. One was a peace sign, one was a, um, a rock on sign, you know? And these kids, you know, that's, that's more our generation, you know, they don't, <laughs> they, you know, but, 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 you know, the, the principal wasn't trained in street gangs. She wasn't trained in, in, uh, she wasn't ever in a gang. She wasn't in a street gang. She, she didn't grow up in a neighborhood where, she, where there were street gangs were prevalent. And yet she somehow out of the picture decided that the kids that were brown were bad and the kids that were white were good and so and moved to discipline and suspend those kids right without having any education on the matter and so you can see where implicit bias and and, and it takes place and discrimination and everything that you that i mean it was just wrong it was just wrong any way you look at it it was wrong right and, and, and this i mean this was a lady with a phd right this is the face and the leader of the school so setting the example for teachers, and when you understand the studies of school to prison pipeline studies as it pertains to kids of color, specifically the African-American community, you start to understand incrementally, this was our situation, but think of the millions of situations across the country, right? A lot of crumbs make the cake. And so if the cake is George Floyd and, 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 and the epidemic and, and, and the results of school to prison pipeline of you know, millions of incarcerated African-American males, then you got to say, well, the, the challenge is, isn't the cake. The issue is, is the crumbs that make the cake. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as believers and as Christians, right, I think at some point, and I, and I get it, I understand that there is power to prayer, no doubt. Mm -hmm. But at some point, wh where does that manifest? To faith with deeds. Right? Where does that manifest to where it actually grows legs and arms and says, whoa, wait a second. I know it's not popular to call this out. I know it may not be the politically correct thing to do, but you're wrong in calling things out without, uh, without any, any pressure uh, or fear, I would say, of, of, of being ostracized socially. 
right? And in a town very similar, like, to Eugene and Springfield, where things, word spreads fast, everybody knows each other, right? That kind of deal. I understand where, where there could be fear around saying something because there's a reality of, man, if I stir the pot, if I become that, you know, I may become labeled, right? I you may know, become so part of that. Go ahead. Well, I, it, it struck a question in me because I have always, um, I've had conversations with you, both Bob and I have, and I've had conversations with Cece, um, being able to ask the questions in a way for me, because I don't even know how to ask the question. Does that make sense? Um, I don't even, I don't even know if I'm curious about what's going on. I don't feel like the, the light is shining um, so that I can see clearly but I'm becoming curious. How would you recommend to someone stepping into that space and just asking questions? I mean, do you, you're a big conversationalist. You love having conversations with people and I know you do it all the time. But how do you encourage that dialogue, or do you? Um, yeah, so a couple things. Um, so I would say I don't I don't know if I I don't know if I if it's, if it's so much that I love conversation, other than the fact that conversation needs to be had and the right conversation needs to be had. And if I'm if I'm not having it. And the question is, who is? And so I think a big, a big part of that is me feeling like I have to have those conversations and making sure that I, I'm having the right conversation, whether I feel like it or not. Um, and so I think that's, that's part of it. I think, too, is, is, is opening up a forum to invite and make it, make it a thing to have the conversation, you know, and not it be a novelty item on the agenda for the season of the year. You know, uh, so, you know, to me, the intention has to be intentional. It has to be a part of the regular, uh, uh, it has to be a part of the regular schedule, just as important as the other things that, that get added to that schedule, right? Um, if, if it's a seasonal deal, right, it's, it, it, it's going to come and go and it's going to fluctuate and, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be treated as such. But, but if it's intentional, um, you know, you build it, you, you, you build it in and then you create a voice for those, you know, I would say the least of them, right. As it pertains to, you know, that doesn't have to be, you know, uh, uh just by, you know, uh, whether it's a, a, a financial economical thing, I mean, that could be socially, that could be, you know, that could be on a number of different levels. Um, but, but I, that's all I would say. I think, I don't think it's necessarily, um, you know, not, not to say like a, you know, a Q and a deal, but, but it's more of a, it's a forum and say, Hey, we're, we're going to come to the table. We're going to bring food. <laughs> I think food helps. <laughs> food, food always helps. And, and I'm also, not only am I going to bring the food, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask that everyone would bring their food, right? Bring their, wherever their food is and, and, and make it something intentional to say we want we don't want you to make something that you that that you think we would like we want to eat what you eat mm. right and so you get to that conversation and you 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 open up the forum i think the facilitator is is crucial in any type of forum like that because you got to be objective right you got to be neutral you got to be you got to be able to, to to drive the conversation without it you know, without influencing it one way or another. Um, but I think that's first and foremost. I think the second piece of that is is uh, is making sure that you understand the power of story. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things that don't, that, that isn't talked about when we within this even you know whole civil rights thing. Because the reality of it is, is the civil rights movement is really it's really about a heart change. Right, it, it really it's, it's it's more than it is a legalistic thing. It's a it's very much a, a matter that 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 I believe is very close to God's heart, and God is in this, right? And so it can be said 
you know, on one end, you know, you could call it a civil rights movement. On another end, you could call it, you know, a, a heart movement, you know, back to God. And so to me, it's both, you know, it's both because on one end, you got heart matters, but then there's the manifestation of how it systemically plays itself out in society. And that's the legalistic side of it. I see it a little bit like um, a, oh, what's it called? Um, revival, sorry. It, it feels a little bit like a revival where there's something has been um, broken loose that it felt like it wasn't accessible. And then all of a sudden there's so many people finding like, how did I not see this? Or how did I, how was I okay with this or that? And it, to me, it feels a little bit like a revival. 